Started. This is Apostle Cheryl Richardson, and you've probably figured that out if you're on my page right now. This is a special edition of Judas Roar. We typically release a video on our YouTube channel, Judas Roar DVAI, um, and that typically happens on Sundays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, which would be 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but we have a special guest today, and I'm really, really excited about this interview. I'm so excited. I don't know what to do it myself. So the title <laughs> of this particular um, broadcast is The Crucible of Domestic Violence. The Crucible of Domestic Violence. Now, crucible by definition, I'm going to read the definition to you, um, and then I'll make it clear why this was a title that was given. Um, but it is a situation of severe trial or in which different elements interact leading to the creation of something new. So it's a severe time of testing and trial. And at the culmination of that, you have all of these different elements that come together, kind of crash into each other. And out of that comes something new. Um, and I'm a military career veteran, Air Force, and my illustrious guest, Jennifer Foxworthy, is a 21.7 year retired um, Navy veteran. And so it, it's just, and, and we both have experienced domestic violence. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Jennifer and then I'll let her tell you all the things that, that I didn't tell you because there's just so much to tell about Jennifer, okay? She is absolutely amazing. We first connected on the Purple Couch Conversation, um, which is hosted by Dana Campbell and Minister Michelle Noel Peak. Um, and they're out of Maryland. And so we met because we both uh, sat on this panel discussion several weeks ago and just clicked immediately. And a lot of that probably is because we're both military veterans. But the other part of that is just how God has brought her through her experience and, um, and what he's doing in her life and through her life as a result of the crucible that she experienced in her own personal life. And so having said that, this is Apostle Cheryl Richardson, again, for those of you who are just joining, and I want to introduce my guest, Jennifer Foxworthy. Jennifer, uh, tell everyone something about yourself. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Apostle Cheryl, for having me. Um, I, like you said, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a veteran. I'm a wife. I'm a mom. And I, am, I just love people. And God is just using me in such extraordinary ways. I'm grateful to have survived my situation, to be able to tell the story, because there are many, as you know, who don't. And so I like to say that I use my voice to help others find theirs. All right. All right. And that's, that's awesome. And so there are, we have so much in common. We have so much in common, right? That normally I just have kind of like a loosely flowing conversation, but I decided I needed to, to add some specific, specific questions because there are things that, that I really want people to grasp. Um, and those of you who are watching, share it on all of your social media platforms, share, share, share. My question to you, audience, is are you doing all that you can to stop domestic violence? Are you really? Are you doing everything that you can? Are you doing everything that you can? Okay, and so we're passionate about this because we know that lives can be saved just by the further education of the people around them. So the more we each learn about it, and, and, and even if you think you know everything there is to know about it, I assure you there is so much involved and it is so pervasive um, that no one can possibly know everything there is to know. I am constantly, constantly learning from my interactions with other advocates, from my interactions with other victims, survivors, warriors, thrivers. And so I want to start off by asking 
Jennifer, and we're gonna give her contact information at the end, okay? What role, Jennifer, did your upbringing or your childhood experiences play in terms of making you susceptible? Do you think it did make you susceptible to becoming a domestic violence victim later on in your life? I would say absolutely, uh, yes, my childhood did play a part, uh, like most uh, victim survivors and thrivers. I didn't have that healthy example in the household. Uh, it was a lot of arguing. Um, you know, my parents separated when I was six years old and then I was kind of used as a pawn between the other to get back. So when there's when there's no healthy boundaries, when there's no healthy relationship or what love looks like, mm -hmm. or a, a delusional version of what love looks like. Right, right. And right. then growing up, I, you know, with dark skin, full lips, it wasn't considered attractive at the time that I was growing up. And then when I was in high school, I had three African-American uh, teenage boys in a class of mine make fun of those very features that I felt uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I really think that did something to the psyche because it was accepted or, un or common for other ethnicities. But to have someone that looks like you, mistreat you, call you out, consider your features ugly, mm -hmm. I think that really... Um, because in your high school years, you're very fragile in your mind. You're, that's you're, you're developing. Yes, your identity, your whole identity is coming together at that point. All right. Whole identity. So, you know, I, I want to say this, and you indicated that there was like turmoil and friction. Those are my words. Um, mm -hmm. in your in your childhood experience and in your teen years, and I just want to preface this. I want to say this to those of you who are listening. You know, the purpose of this is not to critique anyone's mama or daddy. Right. The purpose of this is not to malign their character, uh, to demonize them or to denigrate them at all. Um, I think for the most part, people do the best they can with what they have yes, or what they yes. believe is right at that time. And they can be dead wrong, whereas my mother used to say wrong is two left shoes, but they think that they're right. Um, and that's all anybody can do. So mm -hmm. this is not an exercise in critiquing. And so for those of you who have experienced craziness in your household growing up, it is important, especially if you're a believer, that you tell yourself the truth about that thing. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't sprinkle fairy dust on it. Don't rub oil all over it and declare and decree it didn't happen. Because if it happened, it happened. And God is a great God. So he's he's the great God over what we actually experience, not the watered down version Absolutely. that we want to convince ourselves of. And so, again, this is not about denigrating anyone's parents. OK, I grew up in my household was off the chain, all the way off the chain. But you couldn't tell that from outside. You could not tell it from outside. You couldn't tell it from walking through the house, immaculate house, all of the cutting edge things. Everyone smelled good and dressed nice and looked good. You know what I'm saying? But it was nuts in there when the door closed. And only those of us who lived there knew that, okay? And I love both my parents, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it was. And, you know, and I don't love any, either one of them any less. And I appreciate what I was able to glean from them. So I just wanted to say that um, because I don't want anybody to think that that's what this is about. And, and it's important to me as an apostle and as a clinician, that people understand the importance of truth, the truth. What is the truth? Bring God the truth, not the watered down version, not the cleaned up version, the politically correct version where everybody's wearing a halo, right? Even though all hell was breaking loose in that house with the door closed. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. It is. And we can only get free when we acknowledge that we need to be delivered from a thing. We can That's only get free when we acknowledge that we were bound in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And so Jennifer shared that she experienced, 
you know, like emotional abuse from peers who look like her, but who maligned her um, and, and, and made fun of her. And see, we, we had opposite experiences concerning that. This is the darkest I've ever been in my life. And I think a lot of it is because of where God has had me living over the past 30 or 40 years. I was extremely light and I was the only light one in my household. Mm. So I thought I was adopted. I was convinced for the longest kind of time that I did not come from them because I did not look like them. And so I was, I was bright skin is what they called it. I would get into fights with my siblings. They would call me white girl and I would get mad. And so, and so, and so we experienced that from different sectors. Mine was from within my family. Yours was from without your family. And in my case, I didn't look like them. I did not look like them. The grade of my hair was not like theirs. My complexion was not like theirs. You know what I mean? And, and still, as I got older, it became clear I really looked a whole lot like my father. Um, mm. And so all of that plays a role, right? And how you see yourself and how we view ourselves determines what we believe our potential is. What we believe our potential is, which is what drives our behavior. It's what drives our decision-making. And so right. it's very important to understand in looking back that all of those things that we experience can predispose us and make us susceptible to certain other things later in life, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I say often on our platform, on Judas Roy, that anyone can be a victim and anyone can be an abuser because society as a whole tends to feel that there's only a certain class of people. There's a certain socioeconomic category of person. There's a certain racial component that is susceptible to domestic violence. And domestic violence cuts across all socioeconomic, all religions, all faiths, all of these categories that we use to separate ourselves from one another. Every last one of those categories is impacted horribly by domestic violence. That's how pervasive it is. And so anyone can be a victim and anyone can be an abuser. Absolutely anyone. Doesn't matter if they're a pastor. Doesn't matter if they're an apostle, a, a judge, a doctor, a police officer, Susie homemaker, Cub Scout leader, Girl Scout leader. It doesn't matter. Anyone can be a victim and anyone can be an abuser. So in light of that, Jennifer, how would you explain to those who don't understand how someone like you, an elitely trained Navy veteran who flew combat missions in three different countries, how could you simultaneously be a victim of domestic violence? How was that even possible? Because somebody, somebody's wondering, wait a minute, I know it, right? I didn't think, I always told myself growing up, you know, I'm not letting nobody, you know, put their hands on me. But when you have unhealthy boundaries, low self-esteem, I knew I had the potential, I was smart. So I believe I over, I compensated in other areas mm -hmm. um, to mask the unbeauty I felt within. Right. Because I felt unbeautiful, anyone that showed me attention, I clung to. It was the love and acceptance. Mm -hmm. Again, it's that delusion of what love is. And so right. it, it, when it comes in any form, even if it's toxic, mm -hmm. you hold on to it because you think, it's attention. It's like a child who misbehaves. Everybody's like, they're such a bad child. But there's an underlying reason why that child is acting out or misbehaving. Yes. And nobody wants to get to the root. And so me, I ignored the root. And because domestic violence wasn't really talked about, it, you know, the education, it definitely not growing up. Oh, no. It was not something that I even heard. You you saw it, you know, in the neighbors, your home, and everything else. So, mm -hmm. I going into the service, 
I dragged my baggage right along with me, the low self-esteem, um, the low self-worth, compensated in other areas, compartmentalized because this is my profession, this is what I'm trained to do. Yes. And yes. then I find myself in this relationship with someone who professes that they love me, but then it, it doesn't look, it's, it's like, wow, you know, you know, inside, this doesn't feel like love, but we keep giving chances. I kept giving chances because mm -hmm. leave the baby, I'm sorry, I love you. Mm -hmm. That's how somebody with elite training, we compartmentalize. Yes. We, we overcompensate or we try to compensate and excel in other areas because we're not excelling in our personal relationship and right. there's a lacking. Right. And so, and so you have to have a healthy relationship with yourself first. Yes. With yourself first. And yes. that's, and, and you can't really do it alone because if I, as I've spoken about in previous broadcasts, when we experience trauma, it literally rewires the brain. Mm -hmm. The brain physically changes the way that it is structured. And so I'm not trying to be funny, but you have less to work with, okay, than you had when you started. <laughs> you don't, you don't, it is not the same brain that you had before you experienced all of that. Right. And so you're limited in terms of what you're able to discern, being able to separate past from present, um, a lie from the truth mm -hmm. and something that something that you said it really is confirmation for something that, that the lord told me directly in my time of healing many years ago that how we move from one abusive re relationship to another is that we are focused we are focused on that one thing that we felt that we believe that if we had just had that one thing, that one component, that relationship could have worked. Mm -hmm. if, if I had a partner who never listened to me, I might say to myself, well, if I have someone who listens to me, if he just listens to me, we can be fine. If he can just, if he can just listen to me. And so what an abuser will do is an abuser will come along and an abuser, because you're going to probably tell them, well, you know, what happened in my last relationship was that he didn't listen to me. Right. He didn't listen. The abuser may even ask you what happened in your last relationship. Okay, he needs a shopping list. He needs to know what he needs to present, right? Or she needs to present in order to pull you in. We focus on the one thing that we believe that we were starved for in a previous relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in your case, you know, you, you said it was love. The example that I'm using is being, you know, having someone that will listen to you. Well, then all they have to do, Jennifer, is listen. Mm -hmm. They can listen. They, they can get away with cussing you out as long as they listen. They can get <laughs> away with slapping you upside your head as long as they listen to how your day went at work. Absolutely. And so we set the bar so low because we're focused on what we feel that we are lacking. And that's a tra trick of the enemy from a spiritual standpoint. If he can get yes, you focused on what you feel like you don't have, he can go all upside your head. And that tends to be what happens. Yes. That tends to be what happens. We focus on that one thing. And so when I look back at my own life, I can see how I did that. Right? So so, so this joker listens, but they got a ski mask hanging out the back of their pocket. And we're talking pre-COVID. So maybe he robs banks on the side. And we totally ignore that. You ignore that because he listens to you. Right. Maybe your previous relationship never recognized holidays and this one is showering you with gifts. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is part of the abuse cycle. Go inside your head and I'm going to buy you a bouquet of flowers. Pretty much. I'm going to curse you out and I'm going to bring you a box of chocolates. <laughs> you know and so it, it just, it all plays in and all plays in. And so that thing that we feel that we are lacking, that we are starved for, we are like a heat seeking missile when we think we're in the presence of that and we neglect to look at all the other indicators. Absolutely. And that is how you go from one situation to the next. I'm telling you, when God revealed that thing to me, I was so happy because then I could understand what had been happening in my life. So give us some information as much as you're comfortable sharing about that relationship that, that you were in. How did it start? 
Like how how did it start? The abuse or the the relationship or um, the relationship itself. How did it start, and then how long did it take before it slipped into the abuse? I met the uh, ex boyfriend through a mutual friend, um, a, another military, you know, a military friend, a, a a close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. She had, we, her and I were out and about driving around and uh, we stopped and she had ran into him and his uh, roommate and she hadn't seen them in, uh, for a while uh, since she was deployed or stationed with them at another uh, location. Mm -hmm. And so we made uh, arrangements to all of us to enjoy the 4th of July together. I was uh, thought he was attractive and, you know, things kind of moved from there. And I would say from uh, within the first six months, well, actually, even immediately the red flags were there because he would make fun of my friends, their uh, body, um, whether it was, you know, voluptuous, their body parts, their behind, breast, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, looking at it now, the, does he went overboard or pass any type of boundaries? He didn't see any boundaries. Okay. When you're willing to make fun of a woman to her face about her body parts. Right. Um, right. And knowing that they are very good friends of mine. And then um, we were dating exclusively, unprotected sex. I, um, I was late on my menstrual cycle thought I was uh, the possibility that I could be pregnant. And when he came over and I told him without warning, he hauled off and punched me in my stomach. Whoa. And that was the first sign of physical. Mm -hmm. And little did I know about the three phase cycle of abuse. You know, the, I'm sorry, I don't know what got over, uh, got into me. Mm -hmm. Women were inquisitive. I want to know what in the world is this about? You know, why did you do? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we made up and that completed that three phase cycle. And that's what people need to realize is that it's a three phase cycle. You have your, your, your trigger. Mm -hmm. Well, you came home late. Then the escalation now everything else is ruined because you came home late. I'm just giving an example. Right, right. And you got that full on abuse, regardless if it's emotional, mental, uh, physical, and then it's like the, the regret or the honeymoon phase where everything, you know, the roses, the mm -hmm. hugs, the kisses, everything appears fine until the next episode or the next trigger. And for me, it was hard to identify the pattern because it didn't happen every week. There would be a period of time things were, I thought, great. All, he, he did drink a lot of beer um, that stayed in the refrigerator. So mm -hmm. I think there were many factors with him. He also was short in stature for a male. I think he was about five, eight or so. So, you know, how they say the Napoleon complex, you know, you're yes. short. And so you come with this chip on your shoulder, this, this attitude. Mm -hmm. To make up I for think, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Drove a truck. <laughs> Not to say that short people can't drive trucks, but it fits the uh, stereotype or the personality. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it just, there was the random slaps across the face, but then more so the, the name calling. And those are the hidden wounds that I mm -hmm. discussed that you can't see. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so often, and so often, you know, as survivors, thrivers, warriors, you know, you, you can look back and you can identify after a while when those initial red flags were. But mm -hmm. you know, I encourage people, and again, this is something that, that God really just had to teach me one-on-one -on -one in bringing me through my healing process. It's important to be able to recognize the red flags. It's important mm -hmm. to be able to recognize when they first started. And, and I would caution anyone who's going to do this, 
understand that the first incident that pops into your mind wasn't even the first one. Right. It wasn't even the first one. Look back further than that. Look back as far as you can look and revisit it more than one time so that you can identify with the first subtle, because normally you're really subtle, red flags are. But not only that, that's only half of it. The other piece is what lie, I call it the great lie. What great lie did you tell yourself to make that okay? To right. make that behavior okay? To make that, that uh, abuse, the lack of boundaries? What did you say to yourself that gave yourself permission to continue in harm's way. It's important to, to identify that. Right. I held on to the good times, the the harmony that I held on to. Well, this was isolated. So I, you know, saw it. Um, you know, he says he loves me. You know, the hugs, the kisses, you know, we mm -hmm. go kisses, we do things. Mm -hmm. Those are the things, yeah, I held on to that. Yeah, yeah. So many people stay, and I people ask, why do you stay? Why mm -hmm. did you leave? But they don't understand the dynamics. Praise God that I was not pregnant. It was due to mm -hmm. that my menstrual cycle was late. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, praise God that I wasn't pregnant. But to for someone who would just haul off and do that, um, they're not obviously and not in their right mind. And many matter of fact, Many women suffer more abuse when they're pregnant. When they are pregnant. Yes, absolutely. By the abuser. By the abuser. And they know it's their baby. So what does that tell you about the mindset of a person who would attempt to destroy his own seed in utero? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So um, praise God for the unanswered prayers. But yeah, we stay because when you have low self-esteem, you'll take it in any form of uh, that love and acceptance in any way that it you can get it. Yes. Not yes realizing yes. that love has to come within first. So it's so important for me to, I, I want to speak to youth organizations and, and colleges and universities and things like that because there is uh, that age group, especially from yes. 10 to 24 years old, that's yes. impressionable age group. They need to know how to love themselves, set healthy boundaries for themselves and others to follow. And parents need to know what you don't give your child at home, which is love, attention, and everything else. That child will go elsewhere to seek it. And it's where they go is not always the best. Right, right. And and where they go, you know, savvy abusers will offer them the very thing that they appear to be lacking and will exploit any friction, will exploit any solid relationship, any friendship. Uh, with parents, with siblings, with 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 childhood friends, um, and so I really I think it's advisable for young people, even before they're entertaining a relationship, to begin to work on themselves, right, to prepare absolutely. themselves for a relationship before they even get into a relationship. Mm -hmm. To start working on those issues. If you grew up in a household that was whatever it was, wackadoodle in its own way, you know that. You know that when you leave the house, you know, yeah. when you, you know, as you enter your teen years, if there's something wrong in there, you know what it is. Absolutely. You know something's wrong. It doesn't yeah. feel quite right. You know what I'm saying? And start to work on and start to work on that. The other key thing that I think you, that you um, hit on is this. People don't often understand that you go through abuse. You've got all these chemicals crashing around in your brain unregulated. They're just crashing into it and they're just crashing into each other. And what seems to bring relief is acceptance from the one that abused you. This is why your friends encouraging you and your parents encouraging you is nice, but it's like something's still missing. Right. Because what we crave is acceptance from the one that injured mm -hmm. us. And that's also part of that process. 
And the other thing that you said that I think is important is that, that there's always a cycle. People think there's no pattern. There is a pattern. You just have to step back and look for it. There's a pattern there. You may have an incident escalate once a week. Mm -hmm. Some victims, and men can be victims too, experience this every day. Some go six months. For some, it's every nine months. But there is a pattern. Mm -hmm. If you're in a domestic violence riddled relationship, there is absolutely a pattern. And this is why it's important that you speak to someone that is skilled at assessing and identifying and helping you to identify what is actually going on in your relationship. So Jennifer, what was the catalyst for your exiting that relationship and how long did you stay in it? Uh, I was with the uh, the ex-boyfriend for five and a half years. Uh, towards the last year, six months, it really uh, started getting worse. The name calling, uh, the financial uh, manipulation, uh, where he had a, a gambling habit. Um, I enjoy casinos as well, but I always made sure my bills were paid. Mm -hmm. He didn't care because he knew that I would be the security blanket so those bills. If he, mm -hmm. if he if he spend all of his then good old Jennifer was that was there to b back it up because we were also playing house not married mm -hmm. you know there were so many things that I'm like man but again if you're not taught to honor yourself honor your temple mm -hmm. you succumb to all of these issues right Right. And so I suspected him of cheating. And I tell people when I share my story that I was loyal to a fault. And God knew that it would take in order for me to leave because I wanted, I was, I'm like, I'm done, but I didn't know how or why or when. Mm -hmm. But being loyal to a fault, suspecting him of cheating, that was like adding salt to the wound. It's one thing you call me out my name you rape me you put your hands on me but now and i'm giving you all of me my heart my love my time everything and now you're going to step out of the relationship it was with a uh, a junior service member of his at that and he tried to deny any type of relationship but you know women we have that intuition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, I'm done. It was either him or me. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I have to tell people that's when change occurs. When you when you know you're ready for changes, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired of getting the same results, time in and time out. And that's how I was able to get out because it was either him or me. I now thinking of, you know what, I could just put the pillow over your head. And then, you know, God was like, Jennifer, he's not worth it. You're smarter than that. You right. don't look good in orange or black right. and white. <laughs> right, right. I understand. <laughs> yeah. So I had to, I had to, that rational, you know, that conversation mm -hmm. with myself. And I prayed about it. God provided a seamless way to get out of it. It's just step by step mm -hmm. and, and followed the, his lead. And um, that's how I was able to get out of it. I didn't have any children, so I wasn't uh, stuck in that manner, so to speak. We weren't right. married, so we didn't have those legal things to keep us held, which many people those are the things that keep them in yes. the relationship is that they're married. And especially if from a spiritual perspective, well, I don't want to dishonor God in our marriage if I leave and everything else. Oh, please don't get me started on the misappropriation. <laughs> I know. Please That's a whole don't nother, get me started. <laughs> That's a whole nother show. But and then also with the children, you know, I, I've always wanted my child to grow up with their father. And you, I didn't want to be that woman. But they don't understand when your child witnesses that dysfunction day in and day yes. out, it, it, it uh, disturbs their stages of development. Yes. In a positive yes. way. 
So yeah, that yeah. was my story of how I got out, how I got in it, how I got out. Okay. And so how long after the punch in the stomach, when you all thought that you may be pregnant, how long after that incident did your exit take place? Oh boy. Uh, so that punch in the stomach was in our first six months. So oh basically five years later. Oh, okay. And so it, 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 it's, it's that the abuse cycle is a very powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. It's not something that cannot be broken. It is not something that cannot be arrested, but you have to be intentional about it. And something that Jennifer said that, that I think is really, really key is that victims will leave when that one thing that they just cannot justify in their mind, they have run out of excuses. They have just, they have run out of the misappropriated scriptures. They have run out the bad advice that, you know, people telling them to stay and stand by your person and all of that. For some people, it is when they, when they are able to see the negative impact on their children, whether it be that the children begin to fail in school, that the children no longer respect the parent that's being abused, that they are being spoken to just like the abuser speaks to them. The children don't, disrespect, don't respect them, don't hold them in positive regard or they find children becoming super protective of the parent that's being abused, maybe becoming aggressive and violent themselves, acting out in school or whatever. But it's when that particular victims, when that final boundary is crashed, the one that they, that they are clear should not be crashed, it's not until then that they will leave because right. it's not until then that they fully grasp what is happening to them. You have to keep in mind that in the back of your mind, you might be thinking this isn't right and I should leave, but you're getting this constant, constant gaslighting, this constant manipulation, the constant tearing down and the isolation that often accompanies that, um, which pretty much ensures that you're gonna be stuck for a little bit. I wanna be able to add that um, now that I think about it, because it was service member on service member, intimate partner violence, there was uh, out of that five and a half years, there was many gaps to where he was deployed or, I, or, or something like that. So that kind of was like my relief. So yes. he was deployed on a ship for like six or seven months at a time. And then after we began dating in one location, he had transferred and then uh, several months later, then I caught up to him and transferred in that location as well. And mm -hmm. then deployed. So there was six months or so at a time, like maybe each year that mm -hmm. he wasn't around three to six months or whatever the deployment cycle of what happened to be. That's important to know because that's just long enough, right? To start healing. That's just... Right just long enough to start feeling better and it's just long enough to start missing them and longing for them again mm -hmm. and forget about all the horror that you experience before they deploy right and so it's just enough time and then the abuse gets reintroduced yes yes so that's so, why it was so, such yeah. a hard uh situation to identify the pattern because there was the missing of each other the you know, the attraction, just, at, you know, the traveling and going to concerts and, and mm -hmm. we had so much in common. So I was holding on to those good times and right and everything else. But uh, yeah, when he was home and things would get back to normal, you, like you said, the, the abuse would get reintroduced, re-indoctrinated and mm -hmm. was the, mm -hmm. the girlfriend back at home holding it down. Right, right. Yeah, just a bunch of craziness. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So one thinking error that I have observed in people that I have counseled through this, that I've interacted with, um, especially since we established this platform, is that God sent me through that. Mm -hmm. God sent this person into my life, which makes my eye twitch, frankly, because no, he didn't. But what would you say to someone who might say that to you, that God sent me through this? 
we can't blame God for everything. There's there's that free will he gives us. Yes. And again, that's claiming victim again. We have to take accountability for our choices. Yes. And with yes. every choice, there is a consequence, good or bad, but there's something else that comes with it. Yes, yes. So and it's not I his would, character. Absolutely. It, God does not uh, think of us as a beautiful painting or a canvas. God doesn't, that he created. He knitted and formed us. And he knows our beginning from the end. So he doesn't want anybody to splash paint on his canvas. Right. Take right. a knife to it and ruin it and everything else. No, it grieves his heart. That's yeah. love. And so he wouldn't purposely put us in those situations. But he equips us to get through it and sends us a life preserver to get out of it. If yes chose to to reach out and grab that life preserver right but right not healing denying that things are happening i have that quote denial feeds dysfunction that's it that's and it. yeah when we don't acknowledge what we've been through as a child and it, it left um unhealed that wound is gaping Yes, it forms. Uh, it pusses over and it forms something, but that's it hasn't been cleaned out. It hasn't right. been tended to, and therefore it continues. It may be a different person, but the same situation is happening over and over and over again. And we have to look in the mirror that we are the common denominator. Yes, that's it. And until it. that happens, so we will continue to get the same results. So yeah can't blame it on God. God brought this person, our un, unhealed being, low self-esteem, attracted these, these spirits. Yes. Spiritual, it's a spiritual warfare. Yes. If you read Timothy and he talks about the weak-willed woman. Right. Weak, when the weak-willed woman is not healed and she's not has doesn't have situational awareness, when she opens up her door to that tar, tall, dark, and handsome or whatever he looks like, he's bringing probably seven or more evil spirits with him. Yeah, he's got company. That's for sure. <laughs> Did he come by? Yeah, he's company? got company. You're absolutely right. He has some bad company with him that you don't see or refuse to see. Yes. And if we're honest, though, if we are honest, when you look back, you know. I mean, you you just get you you see it, and but you explain it away. You rationalize yeah. it. And so, for those yeah. of you who are watching this or who will watch this at a later time and you are a person of faith, and you are a spiritual person, understand that God did not send that critter, male or female, into your life. That other entity sent the critter, and you didn't send it away. That's what happened. That's what happened. It got sent, it picked you, and you stayed picked. It picked you, and you didn't cut it off at the very, very beginning. And so the longer you entertain it, the more difficult it becomes to extricate yourself from it because that's how the abuse cycle works because of the gaslighting because of the coercive control tactics and i wanted to address also that jennifer has been really really candid she shared that they were playing house in that abusive relationship that they weren't married i want to make it abundantly clear that if you are playing house or not it is not god's will for you to be abused and mistreated he is not allowing that to happen to you because you're not married. That is not his character. And we need to stop telling folks that. We need to stop telling folks that. It is wrong no matter who is doing it. So Jennifer, as we uh, get ready to wrap up here, That's what is your sense. life like now? What is your life like now? And oh my goodness. goodness. What is your purpose? I'm gonna roll all these questions into one and just let you go, okay? What is your life like now? What do you feel your purpose is and how are you fulfilling it? Make sure you tell us about all the amazing things that you're doing right now. Oh gosh, thank you. I consider myself 
the success story. Um, I consider myself a thriver because I went through a three phase cycle that I discovered to heal. It's not, it's one thing to get out of it. So I went from victim to survivor to thriver. Um, surviving, I believe is just existing. And I know that I made more than just to exist. Uh, it, it's just something in me that I'm like, I know there is greater. Yes. And so I had to acknowledge what I was in. Like Apostle Sher was saying, you have to recognize it and, and call it for what it is. Stop denying it. I was in an abusive relationship. I was in intimate partner violence. Then I had to restore my soul, recognize that good grief, go good gravy, being called out my name, being mistreated, having somebody put their hands on me is not where it's at, not where I need to stay at and restore my broken soul because I have been for so long been beaten down, been beaten down by the three, by other ethnicities growing up. Uh, about my skin color. Then the three boys in my class doing the same thing. Then all the poor relationships, all the boyfriends that I was with who took advantage of uh, my kindness and, and what I brought to the situation, but they didn't bring anything back in return. I have to restore that. And then ultimately, and the hardest part and took the longest was forgiving because of that guilt and shame, it, yes. it was a shackle uh, and yes. it kept me captive, you know, because how, how could someone who is flying with a crew in combat missions and wars and busting down stereotypes and discrimination and being the first of this and the first of that, how do you find yourself in this situation? You mean to tell me, I could signal, I admire training taught me the signal for airplanes, how to swim miles and all this other stuff. But I couldn't signal for help. I, I couldn't identify what I was in in a relationship. So I had to forgive myself, forgive my parents. I didn't like reach out physically and say, hey, so-and-so to the ex-boyfriend, it's your lucky day, I'm going to forgive you now on to resentment and I'm going to let that resentment go. No, it wasn't like that. I prayed about it. Me and my God, he and just released. And once I forgave, oh, good gracious, it was like the weight of the world came off of my shoulders. It allowed me to start moving forward. Until that forgiveness happens, continue to stay stuck, stagnant, and stifled. Yeah. I knew I would. Hmm? I'm sorry. Let me, let me, let me, you just said something and and I have to say this because this is important. Forgiveness is a process. Yes. And something that I learned, you can only forgive a person for what you understand they cost right. you. You can't right. forgive them in advance. You can't forgive them ahead of time. <laughs> and so what happens is as you move through life and you come into situations that you feel that I should be able to deal with this. I should be able to manage this. But because I was in that relationship, I am stunted in that area. You may have to forgive again. Mm -hmm. Don't let the devil tell you, well, you never forgave him. And God right. didn't forgive you because you didn't forgive him. You can right. only forgive for what you understood has yes. been done to you. And right. it's not until you discover, wait a minute, I shouldn't be responding to this this way. I shouldn't be addressing my children this way. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be able, you know, talking to my subordinates in that tone of voice. It's mm -hmm. not until you understand how they have impacted you as you progress through life. Okay, so you may have to revisit forgiveness and that does not require a conversation with the critter that abused you. Let me just right. make that clear because right. that's a big trap. Yes. Oftentimes the enemy will tell people, well, you need to go have a conversation. You need to get closure mm -hmm. and you end up dead. You end up maybe in heaven, but before Jesus was planning on seeing you. Okay. And so don't get sucked into re-engaging even to apologize, re-engaging by letter or any other way. You talk to right. God, you let him handle that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Absolutely. That is so unsafe. <laughs> that is so unsafe. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I just That's all right. Hey, absolutely. People have to know. Um, so I forgave. 
And then I felt like I found purpose from the pain, you know, because, and I started, I then started writing my book and talked to other people. And then I found out about the statistics that one in four women and one in seven men will be in a severe physical abusive relationship in their lifetime. I didn't realize these statistics or I didn't think it applied to me. I have figured it applied to everybody else. Everybody else has that problem. Right. Because I was covering up the brokenness within. And I just, we got to keep it real with ourselves. We always say I'm woke and I'm keeping it real and I'm keeping 100. But that's because you're pointing out everybody else's flaws, but it's uncomfortable pointing out your own flaws, looking in the mirror, looking within of why do I act or behave or say these things? Why am I bitter all the time? Why am I isolating myself? Why am I coping with alcohol or promiscuity or gambling and all of these other things? So I knew that eventually I wanted to be someone's wife and mother. And it was important for me to get to the root of the issue. So that way I dropped that baggage off and didn't pick it up any anymore. I had to work on me. And so now I'm, I'm in an amazing, happy marriage to my husband, Thomas. We've been married for over 13 years. We've been together for over 15. That's awesome. We have a wonderful son. He's 10 years old. Uh, I had, uh, my husband, he had a three older children. They're extraordinary. I love them dearly. And I, I'm at peace. In our household, in the Foxworthy household, I can say this unequivocally without any hesitation. There is love, there is joy, there is peace. Amen. And there's nothing like it. I know that God dwells within his home. My husband is the spiritual covering over me. He spends his time with God every morning. Man, I am inspired by his discipline. And I learn and I grow. And my husband, what is so, uh, there's so many things that are extraordinary about him. But when I come into room and he might be watching TV or on his phone, and I have something to say, or I wanted to talk to him about something, he will turn the TV off or put his phone down to give me his undivided attention. And so I am learning that from him because I multitask <laughs> and I'm selective hearing and everything else. And I'm, I'm learning from him, put the phone down, turn the TV off, or look at the individual to give them that attention. Uh, it, so I could not be doing what I'm doing without a strong man behind me, in front of me, and on the side of me. Yes, but yes. Jesus, just as much as I do. He, or, you know, that it, it, it's just extraordinary. Um, so I'm right where I need to be. And our son, he, is seeing healthy examples. So that just yes. Yes. stopped with me. Yes. And yes. I couldn't say this more passionately because children do not deserve to inherit the generational curses of past. We have to recognize it for what it is. So our son, he is growing up in a nurturing, loving, joyful, peaceful home. He sees mommy and daddy love each other, no arguments and squabbling and things like that. We disagree, you know, but it's all in truth and love. Yeah, and yeah. How you and disagreements can, well. can be respectful. You know, Absolutely. they don't have to dissolve into disrespectful verbal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. what I need to help people understand, I'm raising someone's, although I don't want to admit it, <laughs> I'm <raising laughs> boyfriend I, you know I'm raising somebody's husband somebody's father so if the mother is not right it's going to bleed into my son's life and god forbid I don't want him to find a woman who takes advantage of him or mistreats him I need to set that example and that example starts in the home so I have my published book, Tomorrow My Sunshine Will Come, Memoirs of Women Who Survived Domestic Violence. 
domestic violence is one of my number one sought after topics, but I also give leadership, um, professional and personal development training to organizational leaders, women entrepreneurs, and so on to help them understand that human relation between the CEO and the employee. And that if that employee, if their production decreases, it's not always because they're lazy. There could be an underlying issue, which is yes. domestic violence. Because I share my story of being in the service and how my production was not where it needed to be. So I travel around the country pre-COVID. Now I do things virtually. I encourage anybody to reach out to me. They could go to my website, www.inspirationallyspeaking.com or Google Jennifer Foxworthy. I come up, I'm all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, connect with me. Let me know how can I uh, help you. Let's do a discovery call. And yeah. You want to know more i'm an open book so apostle cheryl that's where i am at today the glow that people see the smile is genuine but before i wore a mask nobody knew i was in an abusive relationship because i love people and so my relief was being around other people they didn't even realize that they were like a healing or a therapy to relieve what i was going through just for that moment Right, right. Just oh, being yeah, around someone who's not, just being around someone who's not disrespecting you, you know, right. is, is a great comfort and a great relief. Um, Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. I know as a commander in the military, we dealt with domestic violence often. And sometimes it would be the wife, mm -hmm. the dependent wife that was the abuser. And sometimes it would be the service member. Um, but we, I was always very, very serious about that. Very, very serious about it. It had no tolerance for it whatsoever. And I would tell them, this is not who we are. And this is not how we resolve conflict. And you need to get help. And if you don't, you're not going to have a career. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have a career because this is not okay. It didn't matter to me what rank they were. I'm your commander and I'm letting you know this is not okay. This is not okay. But then you also want to be concerned about, about safety. So there are so many dynamics when you're talking about yes. people in a profession, in a military, uh, police officers, um, attorneys, because anybody can be a victim and anyone can be an abuser. And there's this whole entire culture that surrounds these different professions that make it difficult to get help and it makes it difficult um, to share that you even have a problem because of right. everything that can be lost, that everything that can be lost if it becomes public knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And so Jennifer, I'm gonna ask you when we conclude this, that you go into the comments and put your contact information in there. Sure. Um, you all, she's got YouTube channels. Yeah, to go subscribe to them. She's got two YouTube channels. She got websites. I have subscribed to everything she has. I'm excited. I, you know, I appreciate you. so much what God has, has done for her. And for those of you who are people of faith, understand that God calls us, he's promised us that he will cause everything to work together for your good. The things that he ordained, the things that we picked up on our own, that it will all work together. But don't mistake that for his approval of you being in an abusive situation. He's not okay with that. That's mm -hmm. not what he desires for you in your life. But he's promised, he has promised that he will make a way of escape. And he has promised that it will all, in the end, work together for your good. So Amen. I've been talking with Jennifer Foxworthy, who was absolutely an amazing driver in her, in her own right. Blessings to you.